it's my pleasure to kick off the, the conference with this first of our sessions um, today. And uh, we've three speakers. Um, and let me just briefly introduce our three speakers. Um, our first speaker is uh, Zhu Zhang from the Bank of Canada. And uh, Zhu is joining us online. Um, and I really appreciate you being able to join us online, uh, Zhu, because I know you had logistical issues and very much hope to be here in person. Uh, but it's nonetheless great that you're, you're able to join us online. And then our second uh, speaker is going to be Jun Yang from uh, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And uh, um, so welcome also, also Jun. And then our third speaker will be Giacomo Mangiante from the Bank of Italia. Um, we're going to proceed in this order, and um, maybe it's, uh, it's worth to just recall for everybody, the plan is to go with uh, approximately 20 minute presentation to allow um, up to 10 minutes uh, for Q&A uh, with the audience. And we also have access to the online uh, audience's questions, so hopefully I will also be able to channel uh, some questions from the online audience to the, to the presenters as well. So uh, with that brief introduction, I s suggest we, we dig in and I could uh, give the floor immediately uh, to Zhu Zhang from the Bank of Canada. Zhu, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, okay great. Uh, thanks very much for including our paper in this program. Uh, I really wish I could attend in person. Uh, actually, I arrived in Frankfurt uh, two days ago. Um, then I realized there are some issues with my visa, then I returned back to Canada. Um, uh, thanks again for offering me the opportunity to present our research uh, virtually. Uh, this is a joint work with my co-author Michelle from uh, University of Toronto, and Simphon is my colleague from Bank of Canada. Uh, the general disclaimer applies. So as motivated by uh, the opening remarks of today's conference, uh, we all know uh, anchored inflation expectations are important for central banks. Uh, here we show you the time, plot, the time series plot of realized inflation and uh, inflation expectations for Canadian household. Uh, starting from 2021, we saw there's a steep increase of inflation uh, in Canada as in many other countries. And then inflation started to going down and returning to 2% uh, target as time goes by. However, if we look at uh, inflation expectations, um, they are not returning uh, at the same speed as the realized inflation. So in this paper, we want to understand uh, what to communicate and how to communicate central bank messages, uh, especially during uh, special periods, we really want to push down inflation expectations for the household. Um, there are few important questions we want to address in this paper. Uh, first of all, we want to understand how the key messages from the central bank uh, they can affect um, household inflation interest rate expectations. Uh, I know many of you have worked on this area, uh, so in this paper, we'll incorporate a few small twists. Um, we are also interested in when household receive the messages, what they say, hear, and take away from the messages. Do they remember the messages afterwards, and do they pay more attention? And for central bank communications, we know uh, in many, many central banks, we have scheduled announcements, we have press conferences and speeches by, uh, by the central bank officials. So it seems that a central bank message uh, providing is more like repeated information providing. And we want to understand how repeated information exposure will work. And we're also interested in how different uh, groups will be affected by central bank messages. While well, we are searching answers for those questions, uh, we came to uh, uh, a stream of psychology literature. Um, those literature suggests that the answers to those questions could depend on what kind of formats of false messages people are exposed to and how often they are exposed to. So to set up our research, uh, we want to present some key facts about central bank communications. Uh, first of all, uh, in real life, central bank communications, they can take different formats. Um, for example, this is the Bank of Canada press, uh, 
Superbank Communications will have a press release followed by a monitor policy report press conference. In the press conference, we release a monitor policy report with descriptions, tables, and figures. And then the conference, we have open opening remarks, and then we have question and answer sections. The fact is that for households, they usually receive information from the central bank in the direct channel through news providers. Uh, in a network in progress, um, my course side will show that a lot of the key messages are largely preserved in the news pro provider's channel. However, it depends on whether we get information from television, radio, podcast, online newspaper, mobile newspapers. Um, the information people received are also uh, coming from different formats. So the same messages, uh, according to the psychology literature, Different formats of the same message would also alter people's perception or recall of these messages. And lastly, uh, it's possible that different demographic groups may respond differently for different formats. For example, in Canada, uh, we often face a situation that we need to con communicate at the same time to both uh, French speakers and English speakers. However, um, the interpretations of the video message uh, could be very different even with provide subtitles. Okay, so in this paper, uh, we, we really want to focus on how central bank key messages will expect, will impact expectations, uncertainties, new attentions, and their conceptions. Um, we designed and we conducted two waves of real time. Uh, Surveys with random control trials. And this survey is done on the Canadian Nielsen Home Stand panel. Uh, in, uh, in the uh, survey, we provide information using different communication formats from real time Bank of Canada messages. And those messages are about the future path of inflation. Here we give a brief introduction of our Canadian Nielsen Home Stand panel. Uh, this is an active panel of about 12,000 panelists. Um, this panel has been underutilized for social economic surveys. As far as we know, uh, in the past two years, we are the only research group uh, working on economic survey on this panel. Um, the Nielsen Home Scan panel provides uh, rich demographics. And more, more importantly, it, it provides shopping behavior for the households. Um, the household will recall their purchases on a daily basis. We have information on the quantities and price at the UPC barcode level, and we can derive information such as number of trips, total dollar expenditure, uh, and based on the store names, we can distinguish discount store versus luxury store and whether they use coupon or not. And from this Nielsen Home Scan panel, we can also calculate year over year quarterly household level inflation rate. Um, here, uh, we put a plot. Uh, the cross-sectional distribution of the household inflation rate. So from the blue to yellow to black to red, we can say the, uh, uh, the inflation distribution has been shifting from red to the left uh, from the first quarter of 2023 to the last quarter of 2023. And with the Nielsen Home Scan panel, we are going to incorporate uh, our customized survey. Um, those two surveys, they took place in the fourth quarter of 2023 and the fourth quarter, first quarter of this year. Um, and each week, we have about 12,000 survey respondents. From the survey, we are going to elicit actual demographic variables, how people consume news, their trust in central banks. Um, in four beliefs, we are going to elicit inflation, interest rate, wage growth expectations, and also their uncertainties. And then we are going to conduct the real time survey. They took place right after two of our monetary policy press, uh, press conferences. And in the treatment, uh, we provide forms of uh, the same messages. Um, they are in the form of video, and audio, text, and graph. And we provide subtitles for video and audio uh, groups. So the messages we provide on our show later, they are the key messages uh, because they decided by our researchers, we also confirmed with the policy set. And also my co-authors now, we manually checked on the uh, press conference day and the day after, we confirmed that all the major news channels in the Canada, they have current key messages. 
And then we are going to elicit the beliefs, uh, 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 the posterior beliefs, and we are tracking the household about their shopping behavior. Another feature of our research is that we do two wave surveys. They are three months apart. Um, about 3,800 respondents they participated in both waves. Um, the advantage of having two waves is that we can look at persistent effects, we can, we can examine information rigidity. In the second wave, we also ask about their memories about our first treatment. Um, another feature of the study is that on the second wave, we also introduce treatments. So there are some people, uh, if they stay in, in, in our research um, um, for the two waves, it's possible they are being treated twice. And we also have people drop out, and we also have people uh, newly participant in the second wave. So in this way, we can look at um, if the effects of single treatment will be different from repeated treatments, and whether single format versus diverse format treatment will be different. So here we show you the, the treatments in our wave one. Uh, we have video, audio, and transcript and graph. The content is, you can see them from the transcript treatments. Um, it's about inflation of, to be 3.5 to the middle of 2024, and it's further in uh, 2024 and to 2% in 2025. Uh, it's coming from uh, the monitor policy report. It's released at the same time as the press conference. We simplified the graph so that it matches the description in the transcript. And in the second way, we reduce the dimension of the treatment. We have video group and we have graph. Uh, the information is similar. Uh, we had inflation closer to 3% um, in, uh, in 2024, and then uh, goes to 2.5 at the end of 2024 and reached the target in 2025. To elicit the beliefs, uh, we use very standard questions in the, uh, in the literature. We ask about the point estimate of inflation, and we use lowest, highest, and the probability of higher than the midpoint to elicit uh, their inflation and certain case. For post um, pre treatment and post treatment, we use different formats and we will change the wording. So, here we show you some raw data of sample average of one year of high inflation expectations. Uh, we separate them by four treatment group and uh, uh, one control group. Uh, as we can see here, they are around 5%, much higher than the realized value. And once we give them treatment and we re ask them again, uh, we can say the post treatment uh, inflation expectations is presented in the orange bar. Compared to the control group, we say, Post treatment inflation expectation, they will write further for treatment groups. And to um, less, um, these treatment effects more formally, we run the following regressions. Uh, on the right side, will be on the revision. Uh, that's the difference of the value in post treatment minus the, uh, the, the value in the pre treatment. And on the right side, we have a few dummy variables to indicate. Um, the, what the treatment groups the individual belongs to. In our baseline, uh, uh, the omitted group is the control group. Uh, we have a very rich control set uh, thanks to the Nielsen home scan data. Um, and when we run the regressions, we'll incorporate the sample weights provided by Nielsen and we'll use Cooper regressions to remove all layers. And in this slide, we show you the uh, estimates for beta co the beta, uh, the beta coefficient. On the outcome variables is the point estimate of inflation expectations. Um, so vertical horizontal axis will show you the four different uh, treatments. Uh, we have three different specifications. The first specification doesn't have any controls. The second specification will have demographic controls. And last specification will incorporate individuals past inflation um, from the Nielsen home stand data. Um, good news is that all the treatment will induce revision downwards. And if we focus on the third uh, specification, we find out it's the most influential one across all the uh, treatment groups. Next, uh, we change outcome variables to the inflation uncertainty. Uh, we find out all the visual treatments have the larger impacts on inflation uncertainty, while the graph group doesn't have too much impact. 
Therefore, want to, want to understand what's the quotation mechanism, uh, we use the following open text question. Here we ask, uh, after we present the features, uh, the, the treatment, we ask them what the features stood out most to you. Um, and we do a text analysis on this uh, um, text, uh, on their answers. Uh, here we present you the word cloud. So for word cloud, if you see a larger uh, number or, or phrase, it means it's more frequently mentioned. So for few audio and transcript groups, people already mentioned 2% in 2025 or 3.5% in 2024. However, if I look at the, the word cloud for the group, Group, um, people you already mentioned 2025, they mentioned inflation goes down or decrease. So, um, so it's possible uh, related to another psychology literature is that people can remember things in two different ways. It's about just memory where people extract the basic meaning of the information and forgetting about the details. They don't they remember that the inflation goes down. Uh, in contrast, there's another one uh, called uh, Wapitan uh, memory, where uh, people only remember, uh, they remember the information in details. So we see this is what's going on when you provide video, audio, or transcripts. So people will remember the examples of information communication. So therefore, you will say maybe um, their points may be smaller, but their uncertainty also being reduced around um, their anchors. So we move on to look at um, all, if all the any treatments could have persisting effects. So here we look at the difference between uh, the pre-treatment of wave one and the pre-treatment of wave two. And we still look at inflation expectation point isolate. Um, we put out actually group has the highest has the highest persistence. And we will understand why. Uh, we use another uh, uh, text questions. Um, we, at the beginning of wave two, we asked people, do you recall taking a survey with us um, about the Bank of Canada announcement in October? So we are the only research group working on economic survey with the Nielsen Home Scan, so it's very clear. Um, they won't be contaminated by other studies. And if they say yes, they recall, they will, we'll ask them what, what you have remembered about. So then we're going to look at two dimensions. One is about extensive margin. Who had which treatment group has higher recall accuracy? Um, so we are going to run this following regression. Uh, for all wave two participants, uh, we are going to define them variable equal to one if they recall correctly and equal to zero otherwise. Um, and we found actually people who are being treated with group, group they have higher accuracy recall, uh, recall accuracy than other treatment groups. Next, we are going to look at the and so um, we have treatment groups and one control groups, uh, so five groups in total. Um, we are going to split them by if they can recall correctly or not. Um, when we use the group, uh, the country group correctly recall as a, as a weighted group. So on the left side, we say if one correct recall has taken the survey before, the effects of inflation expectations are more persistent. On the right hand side, it's, uh, it's not too much effect. Um, okay. um, so we also look at some heterogeneities. Uh, we find out um, for uh, the video, it's English speakers are more responsive. However, it would, uh, for transcript and treatment, English speakers are equally responsive. Uh, we ask people if they can obey this message before. We think we find out mixed results are driven by people who are unaware. Uh, however, for the group, group uh, they have still have large impacts on the awareness aware group. Next, um, since we have trends in both waves and we have video clips of both waves, then we can explore some emotional intensity across the two treatments. Second, uh, we are going to use a machine learning tool developed in another study we had with my co-authors. Um, this machine learning tool will uh, take the video and audio clip as input and will uh, extract the voice, pitch, and facial emotions of our donors. So with those um, network emotions, we can demean and standardize his voice, pitch, and his facial expressions. Um, so on the side of this slide, we visualize the emotion intensity for the four sentences used in the two waves. 
So you can see that kind of variations in his voice and his facial emotions when, when he's delivering the key messages. Um, and then we are going to run another round of regression. In this regression, we pull wave one and wave two data together. So on the left side, will be the revision of these deflation expectations. And on the right side, will be how much uh, involves in the facial e e emotions that each individual exposed to. So we thought a uh, higher voice pitch can help lower the inflation expectations. Um, relating to psychology literature, higher voice pitch could be interpreted as uh, a set of components and can be used as a way to emphasize intended messages. So, so far we have treated um, um, each wave separately or we can put different waves together. So this question is that, uh, um, could, could the treatment effects be class dependent? So that's to say, will how, uh, how people are treated in wave one affect um, the average treatment effect in wave two? So to do so, we are going to define a broad categories of treatment groups. So we use nine graph treatment, and we have graph treatment, and then we have control group. Therefore, to individuals who appear in both waves, uh, we can divide them into nine different groups, depending on how they are treated or not in the first wave and how they are treated or not treated in the second wave. This is going to run uh, the following regressions. Now, on the left side will be the revision of outcome variables in wave two. So it's each minor spray. Uh, on the left side, we'll distinguish by people not only by how they are treated in wave two, but also by how they are treated in wave one. Okay, now we present results from when the dependent variable is two years ahead inflation expectation revisions. So on the last two groups, um, they are um, control group before and being treated in the second wave. So it's very similar to our wave one results. But if we look at the first four groups, um, so people are both treated in different waves. Uh, the two in the middle, they are being exposed to diverse messages. And we found out in some of in the second source specifications, if people are exposed to diverse or mixed messages, they have larger effects than a single format treatments. Um, so we also have very, uh, other findings. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Um, we ask about um, their expectations for average Canadians which growth rate. Um, there's little evidence the effect is very small. Um, we also have, there's no effect on individuals own wage revisions. Um, there's a lot of effects on the inflation expectations on mainly by radio group, and it's driven by people recognize if our governor delivering the messages, they know how to kind of decide the interest rates. Um, so we, we, can, we also look at the relationship between wage expectation and inflation expectations. Um, we, um, we find out there's no evidence to show wage and inflation expectations has any uh, pass through. Um, however, when we look at inflation expectations relationship with future expectations, we find a coefficient of about 0.8. Um, and we cannot reject the assumption of the coefficient of equal to 1.25, which is the parameters generally used in uh, DSGE models. Um, we some studies about actions, um, just um, there are more working in progress. We are still waiting for more uh, more recent than home scan data. So the, the the most preliminary results we have right now is about relationship between spending and inflation expectations. So we we we, we can capture how uh, the log of the total dollar expenditures uh, each week after the two hour survey. And we look at the relationship between the posterior inflation expectations with this spending. Uh, we find out the coefficient is either zero or smaller uh, or negative with uh, some significance. So this is to say if we, we provide information to reduce individuals' inflation expectations, we can say there's a boost of their spending growth rate. Um, I think I'm a little bit run over my time. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you uh, very much, Zhu, for that presentation. So um, I would like to uh, open the floor uh, for comments and, and questions. Um, and I think I'm fascinated to hear. I think we're always kind of asked, you know, how to 
inform communication policy in practice, and I, I think this work is, is very much speaking to that in practice, what formats are useful, how persistent are they, uh, what type of expectations are impacted by it, so I'm, I'm fascinated to, to hear what questions there are. Um, I suggest we collect some questions. There's a mic in the room, so if you'd wait to get the mic, um, uh, raise your hand and uh, maybe say your name and uh, your affiliation, that would be, that would be great. So I have one over here. Hi, Xu. Um, this is Johannes from the Bundesbank. Uh, super exciting uh, paper. And I just have a small question. So on the first graph that you showed, it seemed that the treatment effects across the different groups were extremely similar, whereas the treatment effects that you next showed us seem to be really big. So I'm wondering, what is the reason for that? Is it because of the Hoover regression or something else? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I have um, Wilbert. Hi, uh, this is Wilbert van der Klauw, New York Fed. Um, I have questions about the external validity. So the first question is, um, what were respondents told that the survey was about? Did they know it was a Bank of Canada survey? I mean, I just, you know, in, in, terms, in terms of, you know, are respondents more selective and have an interest in monetary policy, perhaps? The second one, uh, I wonder if you are willing to speculate on, like, in practice, you know, the uh, communications are not just about inflation, but also about the economy and to what extent do you think the message will still come through or get kind of, uh, you know, uh, drowned out by other information that people get in regular kind of communication settings? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Wilbert. Uh, yeah, we have here and then we could go to Dimitris. Thanks. Uh, Gabriel Gleckler from the Communications Department of the European Central Bank. I'm one of these people who is hoping, as uh, Jeff just said, for, for real uh, uh, kind of advice on this from, from your research. One question, when you spoke about the text, both the text, the video, and transcript, is there any difference between how understandable or accessible that communication is, if it becomes less technical, less jargon-esque, whether that has a bigger impact? Thanks. Thank you for uh, this very exciting paper. Uh, Dimitris Georgarakos from the ECB. Um, I was wondering, can you tell us a bit more how you measure uh, interest uh, rate expectations? Is it uh, about policy rates that people presumably are not familiar with, or some people are not familiar with, or is it more about uh, a concept that are more familiar, like mortgages? And then I saw people uh, reacting more, uh, if I got it right from your graph, to uh, in updating their interest rate expectations. So what does this imply so for real rates? So you can then calculate an expected real rate, I guess, for for every uh, consumer uh, and, and see if there are actually um, visible differences across the various means uh, in, in the real rates expectations. Thank you. Just uh, checking, also I, I don't see anything yet from the online audience, but um, uh, if there's anybody else in the, in the room, I could then um, give the floor back to, to Ju. Um, to, to re respond, and then we can see if, if there's uh, any time for, for a, a follow-up. Um, Ju, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, there's a very excellent questions. Um, so I'll try to answer, and if I didn't answer, you can remind me, or uh, we can change afterwards, it's through emails. Um, so, so I think the first question is about uh, um, of how much our regression results are driven by Hoover regressions. Uh, so we, we did a version of regressions where we only use a survey sample weights, but we drop, uh, we trim the top and bottom 1%. Uh, we got very similar quantitative results. Um, so, so, so I think the response to that is uh, uh, qualitatively similar results of whether we use Hoover with sample weights versus uh, uh, OS regression with sample ways and we trim the very extreme values. Uh, let me know if I haven't you know, answered that question properly. Um, a second question is from York 5. Um, um, so uh, when we did the survey, uh, we didn't tell, and the survey company agrees as well, we didn't tell this is a survey by Bank of Canada. Um, so they don't know it's 
it's done by us. So it's we send a survey to all the survey respondents. Uh, the response rate is 50%. Um, um, and it's the similar across two different waves. Uh, and then uh, a third question from York Fed is also about uh, communication. And in practice, it's not only about inflation. So this is very true. Um, so in our um in our setup, um, we provide inflation is because um, we, we as researchers and we also talk with policy side as well. Um, uh, we think this is um, the key messages we want to let Canadians know that inflation is going to two percent, and this has also been reflected in many of the newspapers and the financial market data reports. So in the in this particular period we are looking at, and uh, end of 2023, beginning of 2024, uh, inflation, uh, the past inflation would, would be the key messages. Uh, in practice, um, it, it's very possible that uh, um, central banks, they, they may communicate about their GDP forecast, or maybe they see central banks and not Canada. We don't, we don't release inflation interest rate forecast, but some other central bank may release interest rate forecast. Uh, that could be very crucial. Um, um, so uh, when, when we, uh, one thing we learned from, from uh, this type of information is more about uh, how, people, how people digest information. Uh, if if we want people to digest uh, more precise numbers, uh, versus we more, more people want to know at a certain period, we want to, people know we are keeping interest rate low, or we are keeping, uh, or we are trying to at this moment, um, different central banks are reducing in interest rates. So it really depends on um, do you want people to get a number, or do you want people to get a pattern? Um, so the first question. Um, it's about, uh, um, uh, about uh, some advice uh, about how how um, how we uh, how understandable about the uh, the big uh, the big impacts. Um, uh, I think this is from the communication and the um, I, I may get the question wrong, but but I feel the question is about uh, uh, what could be uh, what could be done um, by communication departments. Um, so here. Um, we, 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 we find out it, the title of our paper is show and tell. Uh, so that's a teaching method. Uh, it's also referred to as dual code. So, 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 so this has been done in other central banks when they present information. So they can also present um, the key messages in graphical way. Um, or they make uh, this graphical on the numbers to be easier to be downloaded from their website. Or they make their key messages to be more explicit on their website. So, so therefore, that might be a way for journalists or even households to more likely to see those key messages. So they are more likely to be uh, exposed to those messages. And another thing we learned from this uh, exercise is by um, our audience, um, it's, they are in French group and also in English group. We sent out um, maybe graphical, it's a more like a universal languages. So they, in certain situations, it could be more effective uh, than, um, than uh, uh, like a video clip with subtitles. Um, the fifth question is from ECB by Dimitri. Um, and the question is about how we measure interest rate expectations. Uh, so here in Canada, we, uh, we, ha we, we don't have 30 year mortgage, uh, we only have five year uh, fixed mortgages or more uh, variable rate mortgages. So we, uh, we didn't tell them about monetary policy or, uh, or policy rate target. It's too far away for those households. Um, we asked them uh, to imagine what could be the variable mortgage rate one year from now. Uh, so that might be the most related uh, rate that they are familiar with. Uh, the sixth question is about uh, uh, nominal rate versus real rate. Uh, that's a very good point. So we ask about inflation uh, we, and we also ask about the interest rate. So then from the differences, we can look at uh, uh, how their real rate will be. Um, uh, their, we can at least, we can infer their expectation for real rate. Uh, so one thing we are uh, thinking about is, for example, in the last regression, when we look at how inflation affects money, we can also incorporate as uh, the difference between nominal rate and inflation rate, and the difference between wage spending and the nominal rate. Um, so, 
So in this way, we, we, we might be able to start it, for example, uh, how how it affects our spending and how um, how nominal rate affects our spending as well. So, so that's uh, that's what we have have in mind for this this question. So exactly real rate and then real real wages. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Zhu. I think that. Uh, then uses up most of our time. We're very much looking forward to the, seeing the continuation of this research, and in particular the work in progress that you just mentioned there on uh, also the effects on, on spending and, and economic uh, behavior. Um, so I, I suggest we move to our second presenter, um, which is Jun Yang from the Board of Governors. Jun, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for being here and thanks for for putting our paper in this great program. I'm very happy to present this paper with Joy uh, Nogis, Hassan Apruja, and Joe Flynn. The usual fact disclaimer applies to this presentation. There are two classical hypotheses for why money might be non-neutral in a price setting model. The first of which is pricing frictions. Firms adjust their prices infrequently because of some menu costs or contract with consumers and so on even if they have a full information about the, about the economy. The second is information frictions. Firms adjust their prices all the time, it is possible, but their beliefs are insensitive to economic news. On the pricing friction side, there is a large literature that studies how micro evidence on frequency and the size of price changes can be mapped to monitoring on neutrality in the, in the, in the model. On the information friction side, we also have a large survey data that has produced ample micro evidence that the average firm is highly uncertain about the aggregate, uh, aggregate uh, economic outcomes. And also, there is a large heterogeneity in terms of firms' beliefs and their expectations in the survey data. However, what is think missing in this literature is to understand uh, how, how firms measure beliefs can be used to assess the importance of the information frictions for monitoring on neutrality. So the central question we are, uh, that we are asking in this paper is that how the individual firm's beliefs can be mapped to monotone on neutrality. And given the large uh, heterogeneity we can observe in the survey data, we also ask whose expectations matter and what ways the expectations matter for monotone on neutrality. And lastly, hopefully we want to answer the importance of the information frictions and we want to compare that with the importance of the nominal rigidity by generating the monitoring of neutrality uh, using the survey data, using the available data that we can uh, observe uh, in, the, uh, in the economy. So to answer this question, we build a new model and this model has uh, two necessary ingredients. The first is infrequent price adjustment. We introduced this with a time dependent uh, fashion. So it, 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 can, it, it includes the standard carbo pricing or, or uh, tailor pricing or a mixture of them. It also includes the endogenous information acquisition. So we, we introduced that as a rational and attention way. So firms freely choose their signal structure, their information set, given the cost of acquiring information. We, drive a, we are gonna drive three key theoretical results. Our first theorem says, Firms do not acquire information in between price changes. They only acquire information when they change their prices. And when they do acquire information about, their, uh, about the economy, they, they want to reset their subjective uncertainty to a state invariant level of the subjective uncertainty. And this gives some idea about the selection in information acquisition distance. In a sense that when you look at the cross section of the firms in the, in the economy, then it is going to be, uh, it is going to likely that uh, firms that have changed their prices more recently uh, are the firms who have a better information or who have a smaller subjective uncertainty about the economy. So this is an idea of the selection in this paper. Our second theorem says about the uh, sufficient statistic for monotone neutrality. On top of the usual load of the nominal rigidity, the duration of price changes, we show that sufficient statistic, uh, sufficient statistic for monotone neutrality only depends on the subjective uncertainty of the most informed firms in the economy. So the subject of uncertainty of the most important forms. It means, it basically answers our, uh, the first question, like whose expectations matter for monotone neutrality. In our third theorem, we show that then, okay, so we have a large data about the price, micro price data. Is, the, is it enough to identify monotone neutrality using this price data? Our answer is no. Data on the survey, data on the firm's beliefs are not only sufficient, but also necessary to identify monotone neutrality. 
Then we are going to bring this model to the data. We use the New Zealand firm level survey data, and we are going to quantify monotone unusuality using this survey data on firm's uncertainty. And we have a two quantitative results. So information frictions approximately double monotone unusuality on top of the usual load of the, uh, the nominal rigidity. But the selection effects that, we hi that I highlight in the theorem one, the selection effects actually dampens this monotone unusuality about uh, 50%. Uh, I'm gonna skip the literature re uh, review for time constraint, but I wanna highlight that we are not the first one who introduced this nominal rigidity in the information frictions in a unified framework, but we are the first who clearly showed the identification results and what kind of data are needed to identify uh, monotone and neutrality in this set of the model. Okay, let's dive into the model. Our model closely follows the seminar works, the, uh, the Golosov and Lucas and Alvarez and Libayan and Lippi paper to clearly compare their uh, results with, uh, with our results. So the time is continuous and households maximize their lifetime utility. They get utility from the consumption and uh, uh, the real balance of their money holding and they get a linear disutility in the, uh, disutility in the labor supply. We, we have a standard CES aggregator for the consumption and household has a lifetime budget constraint uh, such that they endow the initial wealth of the money, the M0 in here, and they get a lifetime labor income, and also they spend on consumption, and they decide their uh, uh, saving decisions through the money, MT here, and they get a profit from the firms. Monetary policy is pretty simple in this model. Uh, so central banks set the money supply in the economy, and most of the time money supply is fixed in this economy. It means the nominal rate is fixed, or constant in the, in the model, but in our experiment of the monetary neutrality, we we are going to introduce the MIT shock to this, uh, this object, unexpected uh, increase, uh, unexpected changes in the money supply, and then uh, look at the, the firm's uh, decisions. The household optimal risk condition uh, implies the quantity theory uh, equation in this model. So how the monetary policy can affect in the real economy, the consumption and output in this model. So if the prices are not one-to-one -one, uh, change to the to changes in the money supply, that generates changes in the consumption and output in this economy. So that's the channel in the uh, money neutrality in this model. Firms production function is simple, so linear in uh, labor, and one of the GIT is the uh, firms productivity. The firm's marginal cost has a two component. There's an aggregate component, there's an aggregate wage, and the idiosyncratic component that is the GIT, the productivity. The log of GIT is a standard Brownian motion with intensity parameter sigma. Okay, let me first denote the, this QIT is the firm's desired price at time t. So this is a log of the constant markup times their marginal cost. So this desired price is the optimal price when uh, under the flexible price world or, uh, and also the inf uh, without the information frictions. And then we are gonna take an approximation to the firm's profit, profit function and we derive this uh, quadratic loss function. So they got a loss from their suboptimal prices. If they, their price PIT deviate from their ideal price QIT, they get lost. And this B parameter captures the curvature of the profit curve. Let's explain more ex interesting object of this model. So we introduced two, two uh, frictions in this model. The first one is the nominal rigidity. We introduced it as a general time dependent frictions. So price change opportunity arrive according to the distribution G with the hazard function theta. It includes a kind of standard carbo sticky price assumption like whether this hazard function theta is constant. Also it includes the Taylor price where this theta function is a direct delta function for some T. We assume that this kind of price change of, uh, opportunity arrives, uh, uh, this arrival probability is uh, IID across different forms, and it's counted by counting process this NIT. We, uh, we introduce the uh, information friction with the uh, rational inattention friction. So form I observes the NIT, the counting process, uh, perfectly. It means that when they wake up at time T, they know whether they hit by this Calvo ferry or not. But they do not perfectly observe their, margin, uh, the, their ideal price, QIT, but they only observe the imperfect signal about this QIT through the signal process SIT. So at any time period T, firm's information set includes the history of this uh, counting process NIT and the history of the signals that they form, the, the firm choose to optimally choose to acquire up until time to T. Then endogenous attention is introduced to this kind of rational inattention fashion. Uh, in, a, in a sense that uh, given the initial information set, firms freely design their, uh, their signal structure subject to the uh, information cost. We introduce the information cost as a, a standard way of the Shannon's mutual information. Uh, in this framework, like the, uh, with the Gaussian 
uh, linear quadratic framework, uh, this log form of the uh, attention cost is standard. So here it means that firms, uh, firms have to pay more when they, when, they, when they can reduce more uncertainty, subjective uncertainty about the, about the ideal price by observing this new signal. Then firms' problem is the following. Firms choose their optimal signal SIT and their price is PIT to minimize their losses, the losses coming from uh, the mispricing and also cost of information. So here the omega parameter captures the marginal cost of information uh, in terms of the mutual information. There's a, a three constraint. So the first one says that firms can change their prices uh, when they hit by this carbo uh, 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 fairy, the time dependent uh, pricing friction. And this carbo fairy uh, is uh, the pri uh, uh, time dependent price, uh, price friction is exogenously given by this theta uh, hazard function. And also we uh, specify the initial, initial uh, uh, signal and initial uh, prices. Before we dive into the, uh, our uh, analytical result, we wanna, uh, I want to first highlight the, uh, the decomposition of the firm's true price gap. So we can decompose firm's true price gap into two components. One is the perceived price gap. So we denote that as uh, XIT. It is basically capturing the how much your price, current price is away from your belief about your ideal price. So this captures basically nominal rigidity. It should be zero without, info, uh, with, without nominal rigidity. The second, second component is the beliefs gap. The beliefs gap captures how much your, your belief about your ideal price is away from the true ideal price in the economy. Then this BIT basically captures the information friction. It should be zero under full information rational expectations. Then the firm's perceived losses can be, uh, 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 can be expressed in this kind of two quadratic term with two state variables that separate basically firm's attention and pricing decisions. Firm's pricing decision Basically, they control their perceived price gap XIT given information set, and in this setup, it, it is optimal to reset to it, it is uh, to zero when when they have this uh, price change opportunity. Information policy is basically controlled for this UIT, their subjective uncertainty, given the given the price change opportunity and the past signals that they got. Okay, let me uh, explain our uh, first theoretical result. Our first, uh, first theorem is about firms optimal dynamic information acquisition policy. Firms in this economy only acquire information when they change their prices. So they do not acquire information between change, uh, between, uh, in, in between price changes. The intuition is the following. So you can think about because of the discounting, acquiring information in the future is more preferable for the firms. And also, because of this, uh, uh, the changes in the marginal cost, this intensity parameter sigma, it means you acquire information today, this in, the value of information is going to be stale. So the value of information is going to be decreased over time. So it means you want to acquire information when you actually need that information for your decision. So that's the reason why you have this lumpy uh, information acquisition decisions in this, in this model. And when they acquire this information, they acquire enough information to maintain a Gaussian posterior uncertainty to a state independent level of uh, uncertainty that is used here. Uh, we call it, we call it uh, reset uncertainty. And this reset uncertainty is basically the unique solution of this first order condition. We can do, we, in, in, in our paper, we do some uh, comparative statistic for, for this. But one kind of example that we can show is that the Taylor pricing in a limit case, as you can see in here, the U star, the reset uncertainty, uh, decreases, in, decreases in the duration of price changes, and uh, it increases in the cost of, uh, cost, of, uh, cost of attention, that is omega parameter, and also it increases with the volatility parameter of, uh, of the marginal cost. One important corollary of this theorem is that uh, there is a correlation between firms' information acquisition decision and their uh, time since last price changes. So as you can see in this uh, corollary, Firm's subjective uncertainty actually increases in the, uh, linearly increases in the, uh, in the intensity parameter in sigma. It means when, uh, when firms uh, reset their prices today, then they reset their, this, uh, their uncertainty at, at U star. And going, uh, until, until they have uh, this another opportunity in the next period, their uncertainty is going to be increased over time. It means uh, some selection uh, mechanism in this model. So as you can see uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this paragraph, so at any point in time, price setting firms are the most informed firms in the cross section of the firms. So we have some selection uh, in information acquisition in this model. Then we are going to ask what are the implications for monotony and neutrality of this selection mechanism. Okay, to kind of derive some implications for monotony and neutrality, I'm going to first characterize 
uh, forms a response to a monetary policy shock and forms output response to the monetary policy shock. Okay, let me think about the money supply increases delta percent at time, 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 time equal to zero. Then forms the nominal wage also increase immediately to delta amount. And it increases their marginal cost and the forms wanna increase their prices. You can think about the firm that changed their prices H period over, and they, now they get a, a, this uh, price change opportunity at H prime period. With full information case, without information frictions, price will jump at the new level delta amount at the first opportunity of price changes. Then the, the, the contribution of these firms uh, to uh, aggregate output is gonna be the duration since the shock happens, this H prime times the delta amount. And the aggregate contribution to output is gonna be the average duration of price changes in the economy times the delta amount. So it is basically the sufficient statistic that kind of usually in the time dependent or state dependent models have like this duration is important to, uh, to the uh, monetary neutrality. In the info, uh, in the, with the information frictions, forms to nominal wage immediately increase delta amount at time t, but from I's price no longer jumps to delta amount at the first price change opportunity because of information frictions. They don't know exactly whether their marginal cost increased by delta amount at that point of time. Instead, at every uh, new price change, it gets close to the new level of uh, uh, new level, the, the delta amount, and every price change, uh, the size of the jump basically depends on the spare duration of price changes. Because uh, if you change your prices a long time ago, then your, your uncertainty is going to uh, increase over time, and now you have uh, another, another chance to change your prices, you have to reduce your subject to uncertainty to a certain level of, uh, certain level of the least set uncertainty. So you, you, you're gonna acquire a lot of information at that point, so that is basically captured by the, this the jump in, the, uh, in these prices, and this kappa, the Kalman game basically captures this, uh, this relationship. Then for my average contribution to output is gonna be the sum of this all these rectangles, and the aggregate non-neutrality is the sum of uh, sum over the all the forms in the in the economy. Then we can basically this aggregate uh, uh, aggregate in the economy. You can derive the measure of the monetary non-neutrality that is widely used. The measure is the accumulative impulse responses, and we can think about the two shocks, uh, two types of shocks in this experiment. One is the shock to the forms forms perceived price gap. It's, it's gonna be the observed shocks. In that case, forms actually observe that shock. It means uh, the monetary non-neutrality only depends on the nominal rigidity part. It only depends on the average duration of uh, price changes. Another, another type of shock you can think about is the shocks to the uh, beliefs gap. It is an unobserved shock for the forms. In that case, on top of this uh, nominal rigidity part, the D-bar, there's an average duration of price changes, it also depends on the Kalman gains, average Kalman gains in this economy. So basically the information frictions amplifies monetary non-neutrality in this, in this framework. And actually this D bar zero times one, one minus kappa bar over kappa bar zero, that is kind of hard to measure in the data. But one nice theorem that we uh, characterize in this paper is that this complicated object can be actually mapped to the uh, somewhat simple two parameters that can be observed in the survey data. That is the U star over sigma square the forms reset, uh, reset uncertainty over the, the volatility of the marginal cost. Then we can kind of back out the load of the information, uh, information frictions and the load of the selection for monotone and neutrality. First, we can think about the, another economy where the information friction is just kind of exogenous. Forms get exogenous noisy information about the economy. In that case, monotone and neutrality, the CII, depends on the average uncertainty in the economy, U bar, not the reset uncertainty uh, in, the, in, the, in the economy that's U star. So the difference between these CIRs basically captures the effects of the selection mechanism in our model, effects of the endogenous information acquisition, that is basically the difference between the average uncertainty U bar and the uh, reset uncertainty U star. Okay, then how we can identify this monitoring these objects using the data? One another kind of theoretical result that we wanna show is that the using just for the, the micro data for prices, not enough to identify this monetary non-neutrality. In, in, in our uh, third theorem, we wanna show that for the distribution of price change is actually invariant to the, this recent level of the you know, level of the uncertainty used. There. And this condition of change in prices, the distribution is basically this uh, uh, normal distribution. So uh, what you wanna say in this theorem is that 
the, just looking at the price change data is not enough to identify monetary neutrality. We need another data, the survey data. We need the survey data about the funds beliefs to identify monetary neutrality. And uh, this basically also shows the sufficiency and the necessary, uh, necessary conditions for the uh, identification. So this proposition two basically captures the uh, theoretical relationship between uh, distribution of funds uncertainty and the distribution of the uh, time since uh, funds last price changes. The key implication here is that if we have the data on funds pricing duration and funds uncertainty about the economy, we can basically identify the CIR, the monetary neutrality. Now, now we are now go back to the data and basically quantify this monetary neutrality. We use the survey of firms majors in New Zealand, uh, Yuri, Oli, and their courses implemented this survey data. We use two specific questions. The first question is about firms' distribution of beliefs about their uh, uh, their own uh, ideal, uh, ideal prices. The question is: If your firm was free to change its price today, what probability would you assign to each of the following categories of possible price changes the firm would make? So this is basically capturing the individual level, firm level distribution about their ideal prices changes. And the second question basically captures the uh, firm's time since last price change. So when did you, uh, your firm uh, last change its price and by how much? So this basically captures the duration of price changes uh, 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 since the last price changes. So this graph shows the uh, uh, result. So the blue, black vertical line, the solid vertical line, is the, the estimated, the reset uncertainty U star, that is 1.2 around. And the black dashed vertical line is the average uncertainty that we can observe in the survey data. So you can, as you can see, the average uncertainty is about double uh, from the, uh, the reset uncertainty. The blue line is what you can observe in the empir empirical distribution of subject to uncertainty that we can observe from the first question that I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. And the red line is the estimated distribution of uncertainty using the theoretical relationship between the distribution of subject to uncertainty and the distribution of uh, pricing spell. As you can see, using the data, we can identify the U star, and also we can identify the sigma square, that is the volatility of the marginal cost, and we also uh, measure the duration of price changes. Then that's all I need for identifying monotone neutrality. Then we can quantify the importance of uncertainty and selection using, uh, using this model. So this uh, CIR is the sum of the average duration plus the U star over sigma square. As you can see here, U star over sigma square, the load of information friction is as much, as impo as much important as the, uh, the load of the nominal rigidity, D bar in here. But also you can think about the selection effects. Here, when you think about the average uncertainty instead of the reset uncertainty in the economy, then it would uh, overestimate the load of information frictions by more than 50%. So in sum, the load of nominal rigidity, the load of information frictions, and the load of the selection mechanism all equally contribute to the monetary neutrality. That is our quantitative finding. Okay, to conclude, we study how measured beliefs can be used to identify monetary neutrality. We argue that data on the cross-sectional distribution of firms' uncertainty and distribution of pricing duration are both necessary and sufficient to identify monetary neutrality. And information frictions approximately double monetary neutrality, but models with exogenous information would overstate uh, by approximately 50%. Last thing that I wanna say about the survey data is that while we implement a survey data with random sampling that is important for unbiased estimation of population average, but we provide some example that where the average actually overestimate, overstates the information, the role of the information frictions. So the measuring the relevant expectations for aggregate outcomes requires theoretical investigation of whose expectations matter for which outcomes and when those expectations should be measured. Thank you so much, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, June, for that. So uh, I would again like to open the floor for questions uh, with the same procedure as last time to mention your name and, and where you're from. Thank you. My name is Jonas Govan, University of Erlangen, Nürnberg. Um, I have a question to your modeling approach. So what you chose is an endogenous rational detention information equation process. And then on the other hand, this pure stochastic Calvo pricing mechanism. You could also do it the other way around. No? Imagine that firms are bombarded with some purely stochastic information and then based on that endogenously 
determine when to reset prices. Do you have any guess or did you even try to assess how that would change the conclusion in terms of your 50% increase in the uh, non-neutrality? Okay. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to collect and see if there's um, uh, any more questions. Yeah, I have uh, Yuri here. Thank you, Yuri Gorodnichenko, UC Berkeley. Um, one, one question for you is, I guess, the implication of the model is that the acquisition of information is just time dependent. Every six months or every nine months or every 12 months, you're going to turn on the radio, get your signals, and then you make a decision whether you want to update your prices or not. Um, I was wondering if empirically this is what we see in the data, that firms acquire information at these fixed intervals, or if there is some randomness there, and maybe uh, some sensitivity to receiving some type of news all the time. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yeah, there's one over here, and or two over here. Thank you, um, Giorgio Topa from the New York Fed. Uh, so we, uh, I'm interested in, in your thoughts on this. So with uh, Rafael Wilbert and other colleagues, we've done some work on on uh, firms' price setting behavior, and I guess two things stand out. One is heterogeneity. There's a lot of heterogeneity. You know, a lot of firms, as Yuri was saying, they uh, acquire information all the time, more or less continuously, about what's going on with their costs, what's what their competitors are doing in terms of prices and so on, but they're subject to uh, constraints, either contractual and uh, or otherwise, in terms of how often or when they can uh, implement price changes. And so I was wondering if you had looked at the heterogeneity in the information acquisition process. Um, and the... Um, Yeah, let me just stop at that. Thanks. And then we have time for one more quick one. Uh, try and be quick, uh, so we can give some time yeah. to June as well. Are you here? Yeah. Um, it's Matthew Peyamonte from the IDB. Uh, no, like, I wanted to ask you what, <coughs> what would be the implication of, of your modeling for the result that we find in RCTs. So usually, like, uh, there are some work that shows that after information acquisition, our firms tend to react to that information. Uh, again, what would be the implication? What would the changes that you have to in your model to to kind of like uh, get to those results, thanks. Okay, so I give the yeah. floor back to, to Jim. Sure, yeah, uh, the first question. Yeah, we, yeah, so we have a clear assumption that the time, the price change opportunity is uh, exogenous and stochastic, but the information acquisition distance are endogenous. We are extending uh, this model with the uh, endogenous uh, uh, time, endogenous choice of timing of the price changes also, like the menu cost model and so on. Uh, what we we haven't kind of quantitatively verified the the importance of those in the in the, in our in our model, but uh, we we think that this this selection mechanism that we highlight in this in this model still operate in the in the model the endogenous uh, kind of the state dependent price models also. One of my paper uh, also uh, kind of have some kind of simplified assumptions about the information uh, acquisition distance, but that model with the menu cost with the information acquisition distance, there there is still a selection mechanism in there. So. This, the question is whether this quantitatively is important. That is going to be uh, our, our, our approach that we're going to do in the, in the next steps. But uh, that's, that's the one thing that we're going to uh, have in mind. And also the Yuri's question. Uh, yes, uh, we haven't kind of directly looked at the in data whether firms' information conditions are time dependent or and so on. So, but one thing that we can kind of direct, indirectly test our modern mechanism using the data is that whether there is, there is a clear correlation between firms' uh, firm subject for uncertainty and their uh, time since last price changes that actually we can observe in the in the survey data so in a in a standard model with exogenous information and the carbon pricing there is no relations between them so this kind of the uh, uh, kind of degenerate distribution about their uh, subject to uncertainty but what you can find in the in the uh, in, a, in the data is that there is a clear relationship between the the time since funds price changes and their uh, subject to uncertainty so that is kind of in favor of our model model assumptions and about the uh, heterogeneity, let me go very brief. So we can observe large heterogeneity in both pricing uh, distance and also uh, uh, information acquisition distance in the, in the survey data. So 
the most informed forms have a kind of the very small uncertainty relative to the average uncertainty. But as you can see in the in the graph that I show in the in the graph, there are pretty large tails in the in the in the in the survey data. So you can observe the large heterogeneity in this. I will back to Matthew's claim, but in the after after the session, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Chun. So I, I think then we want to move to our third presenter of this session, and I think we're we're going to stick with with uh, firms and move more back onto the empirical side of, of things as well. So uh, delighted to give the floor to uh, Giacomo Mangianti from the Banca d'Italia. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, attending this presentation, and thank you uh, to the organizer for choosing our paper. Uh, I'm Giacomo Mangianti. I'm currently working at the Bank of Italy, so the usual disclaimer apply. This is a joint project with Federico Di Pace and Riccardo Masolo. Uh, and the title is Do Firm Expectations Respond to Monetary Policy Announcement? Uh, just for full disclosure, the paper was published last week, so there is not much we can change here, but we are still working on the data, and I plan uh, to extend this empirical specification to an Italian survey, so every comment, critique, or suggestion are still more than welcome. Uh, so let's jump in. I don't think I need to convince this audience that inflation expectations are important, and they've been, uh, they've played a crucial role in managing uh, the inflation surge in the last uh, years. But it's important for central banks to understand how uh, and through which channel they, uh, their communication can influence inflation expectation. Because different agents, we know that respond differently to uh, different form of communication. There is a huge literature on how financial market respond to monetary policy announcement. They pay, they pay close attention to the central bank uh, decision and they swiftly uh, react to any decision. More limited evidence has been provided on household and firms, uh, mainly due to uh, lack of uh, data availability. This is changing over the past few years as we are realizing the importance of studying how households and firms respond to this announcement. In this paper, we focus on firm expectation for the UK and how do they respond to the Bank of England uh, announcement of monetary policy decision. In particular, we exploit within month variation in the responses to the decision maker panel survey by comparing the responses of uh, com filed a few days after with those filed a few days before a monetary policy announcement, the idea is that if you consider a window, uh, time window small enough, the only thing changing between the, the treated firm and the control group, so before and after announcement, is the announcement per se. And the information set of the firms should be the same. The main finding we have is that uh, expected price growth, so the focus is, is on own price expectation, uh, keep this in mind. The main finding we have is that uh, price growth for a UK firm tend to respond to monetary policy decision if they involve a, a change in the policy rate. Uh, and the result is mainly driven by change in the left tail distribution of this expectation. At the same time, we document that firm expectations do not respond to uh, monetary policy surprises the same way financial markets do. So clearly, we are talking about two different agents with two different expectation formation processes. On top of that, we document significant nonlinearity in the response of firm expectation to bank rate changes with respect to the size of the adjustment. Firms tend to respond to bank rate changes only if the um, size of the announcement is of 50 basis points and above. So the small adjustment do not really shift expectation. And I, I don't think I will have time to cover this last point, but just for you to know, uh, we study which channel might explain this result, and one potential so, uh, channel is the newspaper coverage. We show that the, the coverage that newspaper dedicate to the Bank of England decision has a similar response to the firm expectation. So they increase coverage only response to bank rate, bank rate changes. Announcement without these kind of changes do not pick up the same interest from newspaper. Again, this might not surprising, but uh, we think it's an important result for central bank to know that uh, firm expectation are affected the same way as uh, newspaper coverage. Um, I will skip, in the interest of time, uh, the relative literature, and let's move on to the data. So we need to, to answer this question. We need two uh, components, data on expectation and data on monetary policy announcement. Focusing on the data on expectation, we use data from the decision maker panel. It's uh, a survey, firm survey launched in 2016 by the Bank of England, the University of Nottingham, and Stanford University. It's representative of the uh, UK uh, business population. And firms are asked uh, on a monthly basis, so the survey is monthly, but firms are asked once per quarter about their expectation about price and the overall economy. And we focus mainly on uh, expectation about uh, their own sales prices. Again, it starts only in 2016, so it's rather limited in time, but 
several interesting monetary events happen uh, in this time frame, starting from the COVID uh, response of the Bank of England, and mo even more importantly, the tightening cycle that the Bank of England started to tackle uh, the surge in inflation rate. And our sample start in November 2016 and stop in December 2023. So the, focus, the, uh, the question we focus on are mainly the following. So looking ahead from now to 12 months from now, what approximate percentage change in your average price would you assign to each of the following scenario? So firm choose from uh, a lowest to the highest scenario. And then they assign a percentage likelihood, so a probability that scenario will realize. Having this framework in mind, we have a full distribution of the firm expectation. Again, its own price, not inflation rate. Uh, so again, just to formalize um, empirically, so each respondent uh, provide information about the future uh, price growth over this five uh, distinct value, along with the uh, associated probability that the scenario we realize. So having the full distribution, we can, we can compute the mean expectation simply as the weighted average of these five beams. On top of that, having the full distribution, we can also compute the median, the left tail, and the right tail of the distribution which is uh, something novel relative to the literature. We have the full distribution that we can exploit to evaluate how the decision of the central bank affect price expectation. Uh, just for you uh, to see, we have the bank rate from the Bank of England, this uh, blue line. As I mentioned, the time period is relatively limited, but we have important events starting from the um, rate cut uh, to fight the uh, COVID pandemic in March 2020, and even more importantly, uh, the rate uh, hikes uh, implemented by the Bank of England uh, in the last years. Here we plot also the CPI, the official uh, UK CPI, alongside the average uh, mean expected price rate for firms. As, as you see, these two series uh, closely correlate. And on top of that, you see that the expectation seems to anticipate the increase in the actual CPI. This is again su to support the quality of our uh, data. So as we mentioned, we need two elements to study how firms respond to monetary policy decision. The first one is data on expectation. And the second one is information about the uh, information component of the announcement. If firms fully anticipate a monetary policy decision, then they shouldn't adjust their expectation because their information set already incorporated the decision. So we uh, propose three different measures that uh, should capture the information content of the announcement with increasing level of complexity from the firms. The, fir one, the first one is the simple uh, bank rate uh, policy change. The idea is that if firms are in a way naive or backward looking, they do not incorporate, uh, they do not adjust their information set between policy decision. So the simple bank rate is the shocks for firm. Then we propose a more sophisticated uh, measure which clean the bank rate changes from publicly available macroeconomic uh, information available before the announcement. This goes in line uh, with the approach suggested by Romer and Romer and, and Klein uh, co-author. Uh, so again, we clean the bank rate changes just from the macroeconomic uh, information available before uh, the announcement. And finally, if you want the most sophisticated uh, measure is along uh, the line of what uh, financial markets do. So the idea is that they have all available information and the monetary policy announcement is a shock only for its unanticipatable uh, component. So we use the high frequency monetary policy surprises and as a baseline is the series computed by uh, Cesar Bianchi a co-author um, as the uh, three month Stalin future change in a 30 minutes window. So again, this is the financial market surprise if you want. Uh, we have also several robustness check if you want increasing the level of complexity uh, and sophistication required. So uh, we isolate the target component, info clean shocks, news clean shocks, uh, poor man restriction, the results will not change. So just to show you, this is the uh, time series of the Bank of England policy rate. The first two policy rates, we are not able to capture them, but we have data on the uh, rate cut on March 2020, a significant rate cut of 50 basis points, again, to stimulate the economy in the middle of the COVID, pan the COVID pandemic. And even more importantly, we are able to capture this uh, hum-shaped uh, tightening cycle from the Bank of England. Keep this uh, plot in mind because we will use it uh, later. And on the monetary policy surprises side, this is the simple, uh, the time series of these surprises computed by Cesar Bianchi, a co-author. And as you can see in the recent period, the volatility of the surprises is increasing uh, with the, um, over time. Okay, empirical strategy. Again, the idea is to exploit the time, the day uh, in which the firm filed uh, the survey. Again, the, the underlying assumption is that if you consider a small enough window, and you compare firm filing the survey before and after an announcement, the only thing changes 
changing is the announcement per se. So we have the date in which firm filed the survey and we restrict to a few days and a few days, a few days before and a few days after the announcement per se. And this is the distribution of the responses throughout the month. And you see we have uh, most of the firm respond during the second and third week. And only few firms respond at the beginning or at the end of the month. So if an announcement happen either extremely late during a month or extremely early, we lose it because it's not in our sample. Uh, every, everything I said in an empirical uh, specification term, we regress the dependent variable is one of the moments I mentioned before. So the mean expectation, the median or the tails over a constant, a dummy uh, DIT, which exactly capture whether firm responded before or after an announcement. And then the interaction between this dummy and the monetary policy shocks we use. And then we have a battery of uh, firm's control characteristics. The baseline uh, wind symmetric wind we consider is five days, but obviously we played uh, with the uh, window length. There is a trade-off here between the number of firms you wanted the samples and you don't want a too large window because other monetary event, other unrelated monetary event might happen in the same window. Uh, as, as I mentioned, is the monetary plus shocks. And as uh, baseline control, we, we include uh, uh, monetary policy committee announcement fixed effect, industry fixed effect, price price uh, growth, firm size, exporter status, and ONS, ONS releases. Uh, beta, again, is the coefficient of interest and is standardized to capture the effect of a 25 basis point shock on firm expectation. So what monetary shock do firms respond to? Let's focus on the first line, uh, first column. The coefficient means that a 25 basis point increase in the bank rate, we are using uh, the bank rate as a shock here, reduce the average firm expectation by uh, 0.3 percentage points. The fact is not significant, but focusing on the second column, the median price, we see that we have a 0.4 percentage point decrease. And decomposing the effect in, uh, from the left tail and right tail, the third and the fourth column, you see that the effect is entirely driven by a shift in the left tail of the distribution. So good news here, central banks are able to influence with their announcement firm expectation. In the, from the fifth to the eighth column, we repeat the same analysis using the info clean uh, measure of the uh, policy change. And you see that the effect not only increase in magnitude, but also in significance. So this means that firms adjust their information set between announcement, and especially they use macroeconomic uh, available information to form their expectation. And again, we have uh, positive, uh, positive news from the central bank that the Bank of England was able to influence with their decision uh, firms' own price expectation. Focusing on the uh, measuring the information con content of the announcement using the high frequency surprise from the market, we found nothing. And these results hold using all the measure, uh, all the shocks measure I presented before. So clearly, firms and financial market do not react to the same uh, announcement than uh, other agents do. Now, this average effect we documented so far might mask uh, important non-linear effect. Uh, therefore, we propose um, two different kinds of decomposition. The first one is by simply size. We have 13, in our, 13, in our sample, 13 bank rate changes. We decompose them into small and large. In particular, large bank rate changes are of 50 basis points and above, and we have seven of them. And uh, small bank rate changes are below 15 basis points, and we have six of them. So more or less a balanced uh, panel. And on top of that, we propose a time-dependent cut of the data. We isolate the bank rate cut of 50 basis points on March 11th in response to the COVID pandemic. And then again, if you remember the ham-shaped uh, response of the Bank of England during the tightening cycle, you saw that there was small right, take, right uh, hikes at the beginning at the end of the cycle. So we isolate those from the important rate hikes in the middle of the cycle. In particular, uh, at the peak of the cycles, the Bank of England implemented a series of 50 and 75 basis point rate hikes from July to, uh, 22 to February 2023, whether at the beginning and the end of the cycles, the approach was a little bit more timid with 15 and 25 basis points rate hikes from December 21 to June 22, and again from March 23 to December 20, uh, 23. So let's see how this cut of the data affect our results. The first two lines present the same result as before, but again, decomposing, uh, splitting the sample into small and large rate hikes. And you see that the effect is mainly driven, actually entirely driven, by uh, large uh, rate hikes. 
So again, firm expectation responded to uh, monetary policy decision whenever they involve a bank rate changes, but this is only true if the bank rate change was uh, large enough uh, if you want to shift their expectation. Focusing on the, again, the time-dependent cut of the data, in the first line we have the results for the sim single uh, COVID uh, bank rate change, and you see that in this case it was a rate cut, so the, to interpret the coefficient you need to flip the sign, and you see that a uh, 50 basis point cut uh, in the bank rate was able to significantly shift upward uh, price expectation uh, by firms. And then the second and third row decompose the tightening cycle from the Bank of England into um, the small rate hikes, this bookend cycle, and you see that we're absolutely not effective in shifting expectation. Only when the Bank of England decided to be more aggressive with 50 basis points, 70 basis point rate hikes, then the, the firm expectations, the full distribution of the full expectation adjusted in response uh, to these shocks. Um, again, uh, huge robustness check. I think in the uh, interest of time, I can finish a little bit earlier to leave more time for questions. So again, we study whether UK uh, firm expectation respond to monetary policy announcement by comparing the re response file to this survey a few days before and a few days after a uh, monetary policy decision by the Bank of England. We recommend, uh, we recommend that firm expectation indeed responded to monetary policy announcement whenever they involved a change in the policy rate, but not when measured using high frequency data from the financial market. So clearly these are two different agents that central bank need to take into account whenever they design their communication policy. On top of that, uh, we document that the firm expectation mainly react to um, bank rate changes of 50 basis points uh, uh, and above. Uh, this we believe is important consequence when it comes to the tightening cycle of uh, central banks, but especially now with actually starting to cutting interest rate, it might suggest that uh, more aggressive rate cuts uh, might be more effective in shaping expectation. Again, there are obviously uh, more general equilibrium effect to study, but clearly uh, firms are responsive, uh, more responsive whenever there is an aggressive uh, approach towards inflation. Um, I'll finish a couple of minutes later for earlier to leave more time for questions. And thank you again for your attention. Thank you also, uh, Giacomo, for that and for uh, keeping us uh, on track as well. So indeed, that leaves a little bit of extra time for, for questions as, as well. And maybe in, inspired by that, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in a question before I, I go, go to the floor as well. Please. So I'm, I'm interested. I think this decision maker panel is a really, really great survey. And, and you, you, you talked a lot about different things, non-linearities, asymmetries, and so forth. I was interested to hear your explanation uh, for this stronger result in the left tail of the distribution. How, how do you rationalize that, and then exactly uh, what do you think uh, might be, be behind that? The, the other question I had is, can you use this data set to look also more at heterogeneity? Because I think most of what you're doing is looking at the average effects across the decision maker panel. When it comes to monetary policy and firms, I'm, I think I'm particularly interested in maybe the role of indebtedness in affecting uh, the transmission of policy and firms' financial constraints, and I wondered whether uh, you might um, be able to look at that with the, with the survey as well. Um, but maybe we can put this on hold then and, and, and open the floor. Um, I think I have uh, uh, one here from Dimitris in the, in the front row. We collect again and, yes. and then see how we get on. Thank you, very, very interesting. Um, I was wondering uh, whether the firms are randomly assigned by the survey company to take the survey, or there is a kind of self-selection, whether they like to take the survey early on or later. Uh, and related to this, whether you can start closing the window to go as close as to uh, MP announcement and see um, at, at which point you say, quote, quote, kill the effect. Uh, and in the end, is it a panel, could you, also take into account uh, firm specific fixed effects and then still there is any variation left to identify the effect of interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we have another question over here in the front row. Yeah, yeah Raphael Schoen uh, from Brandeis University. Uh, I think this is really interesting work. Um, I think we recently started to learn that in the US there's information in other announcements and speeches by governors and so on. Maybe this is something you, you have looked into or you could look into here in, in, in your survey. I think it would be very interesting to know. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have uh, two here again. 
Um, just following up on, on Jeff's comment, I was also interested in, in the heterogeneity of, uh, of the response of firms. So I noticed in your empirical specification, I don't think you interact the dummy with uh, firm characteristics. And that would tell you a little bit more, you know, Jeff mentioned financial constraints, but also the industry that firms are in. You know, there is this conventional wisdom that for instance, the housing sector is more um, interest rate sensitive. You know, do you see that in in the in the survey uh, as well? Thanks. Yep. Yep. Matthew Piedmonte, DD again. Um, I I was going to ask you if you have like any information about uh, how much information firms have before and after. I know you focus a lot on the interaction, but. Uh, but actually, the, uh, only the dummy like, can say like, how much people acquire information more generally, and if you can control, by, like, measure that because, like, I guess before and after, uh, the information set of, of the firms might change. I, I think it would be interesting just to know how endogenous people like are acquiring information. Yeah, with one more back here. Vitalia Yaremko, Trinity College, Dublin. So uh, I would like to know how much information you have about the respondents of the survey per se, uh, the tenure of this firm, how much uh, monetary policy variation they have experienced while at this firm. Um, I think I can start. Uh, yeah, first absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you everyone again uh, for your question. Uh, regarding heterogeneity, so I can address two questions at the same time. We try to dig a little bit deeper into uh, whether uh, firms are heterogeneously affected by that. We focus on size, we focus on the sector, uh, I think level of assets, indebtedness. Uh, we don't decompose much, we don't find much. This might actually mainly due to the uh, data limitation. We have 6,000 observations, which is not much once you start uh, to dig further. So we, we absolutely do not exclude that heterogeneity is important. We just, in this empirical uh, framework, uh, we did, don't decompose anything. Uh, as I mentioned, I um, plan to extend the same empirical specification to an Italian survey, and there it's a much longer, uh, we have a much longer time series, so hopefully there uh, we can really push on that. Uh, let me address the question on uh, randomness. Clearly that's, uh, you touched two important points, that's the clear, uh, the, the most important assumption uh, we need to make, that firms can, uh, they, they can randomly answer uh, whenever they want during the month, we uh, test this by regressing the dummy on whether they respond before and after on all the observable characteristics. And we, sh and we show that uh, you cannot predict whenever firms uh, will respond either before or after an announcement. Um, so at least given the data we have, uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that large firm, uh, for instance, uh, uh, responded before, uh, which was reassuring because as you said, it's, it's the crucial assumption uh, we need. Time window, uh, we restrict it to two days, uh, up to 10 days. Uh, we lose significance on the bank rate change. The, uh, the magnitude is the same. Uh, we have still a significant results on the information clean bank rate change. So even at, in a two days windows, when we lose the majority of observation, we still have the, uh, the effect. Uh, the last question you mentioned about the panel, that's another critical uh, point. So the, the survey is a panel. Uh, however, restricting it to the uh, five days window it's not basically a panel anymore, it's more a cross-section. As I mentioned, we have 6,000 observations coming from uh, 1,500 firms, more or less, but more than 50% of them responded only once within that window. And for only 15% of them, we have a be uh, before and after responses. So it's really a cross-section. We tried with a firm fixed effect, but it really uh, destroyed the sample, so uh, not much we can do about that. Um, moving uh, from a few comments, uh, we don't have many information about um, the information content available to firms before the announcement. More recently, uh, some questions have been added asking about other form of expectation, like interest rate expectation. These also connect to uh, Vitalia's question about uh, information. Uh, we don't exploit them here also because they were introduced uh, late 2022. So again, even a shorter time sample, given that uh, our analysis stopped in 2023. Uh, it will be interesting to add ad hoc question asking uh, before a monetary policy decision, uh, what they think about it or uh, whether they heard the news, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, much room for, uh, for personalized the survey, unfortunately. So uh, this is the best I think we can do, given the data availability. And I think that partially covers uh, your question about, uh, as well. Uh, uh, Rafael, can you uh, remind me, sorry, your question? Yeah, there's other information Ah, sorry, yes, yes. Uh, that's true. Recently, uh, it has been found that uh, speeches or uh, 
not standard communication uh, meetings have important effect on the financial markets. Uh, in this analysis, we haven't considered them, um, also because we find that uh, even within the important meetings, firms do not respond unless there is a bank rate changes. Uh, but I guess it would be interesting to extend the, the time sample uh, and, and evaluate whether uninformal communication can still affect their expectation. Uh, although, again, given that we found that only bank rate changes are able to affect the distribution of expectation, uh, I doubt that firms pay attention to speeches from the, from the governor uh, or something like that. And I think the, your last question was about the heterogeneous effect across the, along the distribution. And actually, the fact that the left tail is the most responsive is in line with theoretical literature, suggesting that it's more expensive for firms uh, kind of to, uh, to misinterpret uh, change in the left tail of the distribution rather than the left tail. So probably they are more cautious when it comes to the lowest scenario than when it comes to the right scenario. So uh, it's, a, it's costly for them to overestimate and underestimate uh, price changes. That's why they tend to adjust one, one tail more than the others. But it might also relate to the to the kind of bank rate changes we have in the sample, most of them are uh, rate hikes. Only one rate cut, but it was a major one that shifted the entire distribution. But thank you, everyone, again, for your question. Yeah, thank you as well, Giacomo. Actually, I, uh, maybe we still have a minute left, um, so I, I don't know if there's any um, uh, further quick questions. But maybe if I could come back on the, on the, um, the cut uh, and the result that you have, you have there as well. So you, you seem to have this asymmetry that the, the effect of the cut is uh, stronger than the effect of interest rate increases in your in your analysis, and and kind of also so you know cut rates and uh, firms actually increase their their own selling price expectations more significantly. So I'm interested to understand your thinking about that, and I'm particularly maybe a little bit concerned that this was done during the COVID period, and whether there are other confounding factors going on there, even in the small windows that you use for the estimation. You know we had international trade being blocked a lot. Uh, this was COVID. Uh, there was a lot of supply cost pressures on, on firms as well. I'm, I'm wondering, does this uh, result pick up some of that as well? But do you have an explanation for the asymmetry that you, you identified? So uh, first of all, that's a great point. Uh, we, we do it also for the uh, surprises to decompose them into positive and negative, small and large, and there we find nothing. Uh, so just to reassure you that it's really the bank rate changes. Uh, and. I'm not sure I would push it for rate cut versus rate hikes, because as you mentioned, this was a rate cut in an extremely unique period with a lot of going on. Uh, and I wouldn't say that rate cut are more effective, at least from the results, uh, I wouldn't say they are more effective than rate hikes. Uh, as you mentioned, even in a 10 days windows, uh, it was a crazy period, a lot going on, uh, restriction. Uh, so it was still surprising to see that um, it was able to shift the full, di uh, full distribution. At the same time, you have to imagine that uh, there was the, the peak of attention on the Bank of England decision uh, in that particular date. So that could compensate kind of the, the high uncertainty that was uh, around that period. So everyone was tuned in uh, to see what uh, the Bank of England was deciding. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for the, your question. Thank you, uh, then, Giacomo. So this brings us to the end of the first session. A big thanks uh, to um, the three presenters uh, and to everybody for the audience engagement as well. We're going to move to a coffee break. We have a short uh, coffee break, so we've 15 minutes, and we're coming back here to start with session two at, a, at 11 uh, a.m. But before we go, I'd just like to see if we can thank the presenters for... Oh, thank you.